Good evening. Thank you all for coming along. It's great to see so many people here. I just want to start by saying uh, white shirt and black jacket is not Becker standard issue. It's just uh, <laughs> contrary to belief. Uh, my name is Vijay Patel. I'm an associate structural engineer with Becker here in the Auckland office. It's my pleasure to share with you a project that's formed a large part of my working life and also helped shape my career to where it is today. I graduated from the University of Auckland some nine years ago now, worked on site for the first year and a half before making the move into the consultancy office, worked for a company called Buller George for the first four and a half years before moving to Becker. I've been there for nearly four years now, worked on some fantastic projects and worked with some of Becker's largest clients. That's including Auckland International Airport, Sky City, WDHB, ADHB, NZ and NZTA to name a few. And I can't forget the University of Auckland, whom I've also worked with for nearly four years now. Since the first day I walked into the office, I was involved with the master planning of the science sector. No one knew how, beast this, how big this beast was going to be. You got the clicker? Sorry. <laughs> no one knew how big this beast was actually going to be, and what resulted was a five-stage, $290 million project. The final piece of this puzzle is the Science Centre, which is under construction at the moment on the corner of Wellesley and Simon Street, opposite the Engineering School and the School of Architecture. My role was that of the lead structural engineer. I was responsible for the interdiscipline coordination of the structure with the services and the architecture. I was the main point of contact with the consultancy team and I worked very closely with the client. We had a team of engineers and draftees which grew to as many as 15 people at its peak during the crunch of detailed design. Just an overview of the Science Centre Tower. It's a 13 storey building. It's got 11 floors above ground level. It's a lightweight roof and a single storey basement. It's got a total floor area of approximately 24,000 square metres. It was replacing an old and dated reinforced concrete frame and shear wall building. It was construct the original building was designed and constructed in the 1960s and it was very robust. It had concrete that got up to about sort of 70 MPA. The client expressed an interest in keeping the existing grid layout for space planning purposes. They also asked if they could retain as much of the existing concrete structure as possible. What we found that not only was that going to be difficult to design, it was going to be very difficult to construct, and it also would inhibit their space planning with the large shear walls. Consequently, the grid layout was kept, and we've demolished the building down to foundation level, down to, down to here, at the bottom of the basement. The new columns do line up with the existing foundations, but what that meant is we need to keep the structure as lightweight as possible. That gave rise to a structural steel frame, composite metal floor decking, and we've used buckling restrained braces, or more commonly known as BRBs, as the lateral resisting system. The basement level is all reinforced concrete, reinforced concrete walls and beams, and we've used reinforced concrete piles to supplement the existing bell-shaped piles from the 1960s. You can sort of see them here, so it's a little bit faint given the um, small screen. The building is predominantly being used as teaching spaces and mixed office use. It's got undergraduate labs, postgraduate labs, and also <coughs> research labs. Because of the large amount of labs, it really became a services driven building and we need to provide flexibility for the services at the time of design and also in the future. Like all projects, this project had its own constraints and I'll just touch on what some of the design drivers were. For starters, it was a very congested, tight inner city site. The client wanted operational continuity following a seismic event and also wanted to minimise the amount of non-structural damage following an earthquake. We had to utilise the existing foundations by default of the grid system that was supplied to us. Had to minimise the number of bracing elements that were going to be intruding into the floor plates just to allow for future flexibility. And that has given rise to bracing on only the perimeter, on the four edges of the building. There are lots of large atrium voids within this building. I mean, we've got discontinuous floor plates and our diaphragm design had to, had to incorporate these holes. It's got open plan layouts, so therefore footfall and reduced vibration on the long span composite beam became a very big issue. And again, it's a services driven building. This building was not only interesting, but was very challenging to design. There are three items that I do really want to touch on. It's the structural steel beams, the foundations, and also the BRBs, or the buckling restraining braces. For starters, the structural steel beams. As mentioned, this is a heavily serviced building. You can see here, this is a shot of the floor plan. You've got the structure here in red. You've got the services intertwined with the structure shown in blue. 3D coordination of this building was conducted in Revit. The building services engineers, us structural engineers, and the architects all worked on a common platform using Revit. Becker was actually, in fact, 
um, employed as the services and the structural engineers. What that meant is that we could actually work in the model in real time. So any time we placed a hole somewhere, they were very quick to fill it with something. <laughs> We've got um, castellated beams that have been used as, a primary, as the secondary beams. Regular holes at regular centres. We're able to join two of these holes together to form quite large openings to allow for mechanical, penetration, uh, mechanical ducts to reticulate through them. And these, and these beams are supported on primary beams, which are also tapered which means that we could have services reticulation quite close to the columns. What we did at the outset, we liaised with our services friends quite early on with the castellated beams and the, and the tapered beam structure. This, base, this provided its weight in gold. It meant that we could provide sufficient openings to the structure without them having to come back to us every other day asking for more penetrations. The longest beams on this, on this project are 14.8 metres, and we knew that these had the potential to be relatively lively. So when I talk about liveliness, I talk about the, the beam's bounce or its movement, and that's induced by someone or something. It's sort of like the sky tower blowing around in the wind. Because of this, we created a finite element model using the Oasis GSA suite of programs. This allowed us to ascertain the problem areas that were going to be present on, this, on these floor plates, target our treatment and stiffening to certain areas, and also advise the university on which areas were going to be more lively and therefore where they should avoid with their, uh, with their sensitive equipment and, um, and experiments. This here is a floor plan showing the sensitivity of the floor. Red, obviously not too good. We're trying to get as much green and blue as possible. And that's the floor plan with no treatment. Once we did come through and we used our treatment, which I will touch on very soon, we came up with a, plan, a floor plan which has a lot of green and blue in it. From this info, we're able to set design criteria to manage the client's expectations. So the treatment options, we went through and had to investigate the treatment options that we would use. And what we came across was a product called Resitec, which is procured out of the UK, and to our knowledge, hadn't been used on any other project throughout New Zealand previously. Resitec is a viscoelastic damper. Basically, it's a piece of rubber sandwiched between two steel plates. So it's, it's, it's not a very scientific piece of material. It's um, subject to shear deformation, and that's how it works. It gets placed between the floor slab and the structural steel beams. The Resitec can be placed across the floor, uh, across the beams in two ways. You can place it across the whole beam, and that will give you up to an additional 4% damping, or you can place it over part of the beams and you get additional 2% damping. We chose to place it over part of the beams so we could retain strength and uh, where we need it, where the bending moment was going to be highest. So just in comparison, if you've got a bare floor with just partition services, you're going to have a floor which is going to give you about 2% damping. So we effectively double that by using this product. The next item I just want to touch on is the foundations. As we were driven to land the columns on existing foundations that didn't have sufficient strength for the new building, we had to supplement these with piles that were tied together using large transfer pile caps. These pile caps are actually 4 metres long by a metre and a half wide by 2.5 metres deep. They're about 15 metres cubes. They can take the equivalent of about three concrete trucks. Steel isolation caps were used to, to um, isolate the existing piles so we didn't overload them. These allowed us to provide a delayed settlement joint. We're going to construct the building up to level six before these were grouted. As we went through the design, the contractor sort of said that there could be the potential issue with constructing these, so we went through and modelled them for them. We've placed the pile, you can sort of see here, this is the indicative layer. You've placed the steel cap over top of the existing pile, drop your reinforcing cage on, drop your steel column in, place your reinforcing, which is threaded <coughs> through the steel columns, drop your top layer of reinforcing on, and then come through and form your ground beam around the existing, um, around the new steel column. Again, the contractor did highlight that these were going to be tricky to build, so with all this modelling, they still sort of thought, well, there are a lot of constraints here. And as you can see here, there's existing walls, which they had to sort of work around, therefore they could only access these pile caps from one side. They had to thread the Rio through these steel columns, because they are very large columns, and there's just the access into these areas and the holes. Because of that, they did clear a space on their site, which is a very tight site, and they built one of these. They built one just on a platform, and what they did, they used a steel column, uh, sorry, a timber column, which was, which was dubbed the Trojan column, built this up, formed the reinforcing around it, and what they found was this was very beneficial. 
Once they got onto site and actually dropped these in and started to construct them on site, they found that there were very few issues with these. So BRBs, a lot of you might not know what a BRB is or what BRB actually stands for. So buckling restrained braces, I'll just give you a quick overview of what a BRB is and how we integrated these into our project. So following the Christchurch earthquakes, low damage design philosophies became more relevant as, climate, as clients became more aware of the risks. BRBs were first used and manufactured in Japan in the 1980s. The US adopted this technology in the early 2000s and it's still relatively new to New Zealand, with only a handful of buildings with BRBs in them to this date. This project, I believe, has been the first New Zealand building designed with US braces. There was one other building designed at the time, but it used a homegrown brace manufactured in New Zealand. A BRB has equal tension and compression capacities. They're an effective damping system to limit non-structural damage, and stiffness can be tuned during design. Basically, not too little, not too rough, not too little, not too light, just the right amount of damping. The university has a lot of expensive research equipment which they need to protect and they were keen to investigate their potential options to do so. BRBs are replaceable. Basically, they're, they're like fuses. As soon as they have undergone a seismic event and they have gone plastic, you can actually remove one of these out of the building and just bolt in another one. This one shown here is actually a bolted brace. Undo the bolts, throw a new one in. This BRB, we're told, can undergo 14,000 stress cycles. They're very efficient and cost effective as we only have four braces in each direction, as you can sort of see with the diagram in the corner there, um, in each direction per level, I should say. It is emerging technology, though, so we were fortunate to have a very proactive uh, client who we took to the US. Some might say they took us to the US, but um, we took them to visit the three largest manufacturers to have a look at their plants have a look at the manufacturing, the quality and the procedures that they undertook. The largest braces that we do have on this project, they allow 75 mils of movement. It has a 25 square inch steel core or an effective 125 square millimetres of steel. I'd just like to conclude by saying that this has been a truly incredible project to be part of. I'm into my fifth year of working with the university and I enjoy working with this team. I've been fortunate to form some great relationships along the way and, in, and have thoroughly enjoyed this journey. I've learned a lot from this experience and have been able to, to apply this to other jobs also. I've actually just returned from Hong Kong after presenting our concept design to our client for the new $120 million waterfront hotel which I'm currently leading. I look forward to the challenges that lie ahead in my career. Unfortunately for us as structural engineers collectively, our our clever solutions that we often employ onto a project are often covered up from public view. Like the smart beam profiles here that we use for our services reticulation, they're going to be hidden by pretty architectural ceilings. All the innovative pile caps that we've got here, they're going to be cast in concrete and covered in soil for nobody else to ever see. At least I've been able to give you an insight into the innovative solutions that we have used on the Science Tower and hopefully next time you pass a construction site you'll ponder what smart structural gems are hidden inside this building. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, BJ. We've probably got time for one or two questions quickly. Anyone like to ask anything? There's plenty of time oh, over there. Oh, thanks for your presentation, BJ. It's very interesting. Um, you mentioned pretty architecture. <laughs> Yeah, like all projects, uh, the architects and the structural engineers generally do clash with their views and the architects are going to shoot very high for what they do want, where the structural engineers try and get a nice regular building. Um, we did concede on many occasions on, on a few items. There are a lot of, um, and it's not too visible from these slides unfortunately, but there's some very large atrium voids. They've got three main atriums over the height of the building and the design of the diaphragms and the um, floor slabs was, became very complex because of this. We've got some quite complex strut and tire models and some quite tight bands of reinforcing that we've had to place throughout these slabs. Um, also, there's a, um, on one of the slides you would have seen, there's a, can there's a diagonal facade system. Basically, it's a meter, spanning a meter out from the actual building. It's got a two-way cantilever and we've also had to put slip joints in it. So trying to design all that, coordinate all that and get that, even getting that constructed at the moment has been um, a particular challenge, but I think the final result's gonna be gonna be worth it. Okay. Well thank you BJ. That's great. Yeah, thank thank you. you.